Now, the very first question everyone always asks, and I'm pretty sure that when I when I be looking at the chat right now, this is here. Yes, the slides are available, um, so you can go to janjungman.com right now um, and get the slides from there. And also, the tutorial that we're going to be doing um, is written out already, and it's going to be living on our blog. And this link is also available in the slides. Um, I'm doing this live, and I don't have any help. So during my presentation, I cannot see any of the questions. Um, once we're done with the kind of formal parts and we're actually going to build something, I can see them. So save up your questions for them. Um, one of the coolest photos, I think, in uh, if, if you've seen one of my talks earlier at, at the Global Conference in Amsterdam, um, you might have recognized this. Uh, while I was at ARM, together with uh, Johan, the CTO of the Things uh, Industries, and, and Nicolas Sornin, the inventor of LoRa, we worked really hard on getting firmware updates out. Um, and that was fantastic. Johan and I were sitting in a bar a couple of years back, and we were kind of brainstorming on what would hold LoRaWAN back at that point. And we identified from Red Days, realized that Nikola was also there, um, build it, pushed it through, um, and now it's a standard in LoRa lines. Um, that's kind of cool. I think that the power that you have in a community is this, where you see emerging technology, you think, well, there's something that can be, that's really interesting. And I think there's a way for me to fix this or make this emerging technology better, which kind of I hope that everyone in the community um, has a feel for. So you can actually do that. And, and deploy that and now and develop it into a global standard, which is really fucking awesome. Um, but yeah, to, up to my new endeavors. So the typical LoRaWAN sensor in 2020 is hardware-wise a marvelous piece. So this is, uh, this is one of the most famous LoRa sensors, um, quite, quite, well, uh, quite well known, quite used a lot. Really nice sensor. That has a vibration sensor that can measure vibrations up to a thousand times a second. Amazing technology. It has a temperature sensor. It has NFC to um, do some commissioning, and it's water and even explosion proof. Like hardware-wise, and that in a really nice small package. You know, hardware hardware-wise is an amazing piece, uh, amazing product. Um, and kind of the reason why we can do that is now because sensor technology has shrunk and increased so much, increased in quality and shrunk in in both price um, and in size that we can now make these really powerful, amazing little devices that can measure the world around us. Um, they also come paired with really powerful processors. Kind of every device that you, that you currently buy, every sensor that you buy has a, has a processor that's capable of running millions of instructions per second. Um, yes, these are low power parts, and typically you don't, wanna, you don't wanna do too much with them because they run off battery, but they're really, really powerful processors. And there's a lot of them. Um, Every year, currently, there's 30 billion, 30 billion microcontrollers being shipped. It's amazing. Like my, my piano here um, has six microcontrollers sitting in a piano already, and then three more in a pedal. It's it's tremendous. Really, really powerful devices. Actually, they can actually do quite quite a lot. Um, but when we look at like what do we use all those devices for? What is the what is the thing that we for example, with this sensor, what, what do we actually do with this device? Very little, like kind of, and this is something we see a lot in the industry, like once an hour you send the average motion, the peak motion, the current temperature out. Lots and lots, way too many, in my, in my taste, LoRa devices, um, are just resorting to sampling a little bit of data and then sending it back to the network. And as, this is of course natural because, well, we're dealing with, um, Power constraint devices, they need to run off a battery very often. The whole reason that this device does it only once an hour out of the box is because it needs to run for years off the battery. Um, and the second is that we are very bandwidth constrained. Even if I wanted to send much more information about the motion, then I can't really do that because, well, uh, I need to send it over LoRa, so I have very limited downlink available um, and limited uplink. So we kind of see the premise, the premise for me of starting Edge Impulse um, was that we saw that 99% of sensor data currently is discarded one way or another. Sometimes it's very visible, like here we know that we can sample a thousand times a second, but then even we only send the peak motion every hour. Um, sometimes it's a bit more subtle. Um, but 99% of sensor data is discarded due to cost bandwidth or power constraints. Um, and it means that lots of really interesting events, things that my sensor is capable of actually detecting, we're not acting upon, that lots of these really interesting events get lost. Um, this is a, a stream of data coming from an accelerometer. Um, and if I'm only looking at the peak motion, 
at any point, and at the default configuration of the device we saw prior, um, then this is the only point out of all this data that is going to be sent. Everything else we throw away. And the chance that I'm actually interested in this specific peak is not that big because it's, well, it's very similar to all the other peaks. It just, you know, apparently a few, uh, it's a little bit higher than the others. But that's why I'm sending it. But for me, probably the more interesting event in this stream is, well, here, something is happening here. I don't know what, but it's infinitely more interesting than just that peak motion. Um, also, because we're throwing away so much sensor data and we try to like capture, um, and we try to capture that into a single value, like for example, the, the average motion that we send out um, can be incredibly misleading. Like here, I'm doing two different motions with an accelerometer, where one where I'm moving a device up and down, the other one where I'm making a circle with the device. Um, if you look at the average motion in both of these signals, the up down is 3.36 and the circle is 3.35. Um, so compressing all these features, all these amazing amounts of sensor data down to these very, down to just two numbers or three numbers because of the, the, the bandwidth and power considerations that we have um, can be tremendously misleading. So my feeling is that on-device intelligence is is the only solution. We shouldn't be able, we shouldn't send um, kind of aggregated values or peak values to the network, and we can't send any raw data. But rather, the sensor needs to be more intelligent and actually need to uh, need to see when something is amiss or something is happening. So rather than sending a peak and average motion to a cloud location and trying to figure out which of these devices is uh, behaving abnormal. The device itself should be able to say, well, what I now see is a vibration pattern that I know that's going to lead to a fault state in a week. Um, or the temperature is varying in a way that I've never seen before. Um, or even mach the machine that I'm attached to oscillates different than all the other machines in the factory. Um, and this kind of needs to happen on device because this means if we do this on device, we can compress this data much down much further. Um, we could say, well, the temperature varies in a way that I've never seen before. Well, that is one byte. It's just if status three is is sent, then that is what it means. Um, so we get our devices are more intelligent, more capable. They can detect much more interesting events, and we can still adhere to our power and bandwidth budgets. Um, so this is kind of the the situation that I would like to go into. Um, now, if you think about what what technologies do we have? to look at these kind of problems. Um, in essence, it's, it's the art of finding patterns in messy data. I have a lot of sensor data. The vibration sensor on this thing might, might give me data a thousand times a second. And then I want to find, then I either want to classify what is happening, I want to find a pattern based on historical data, or I want to find anomalies. I want to uh, see when the pattern that I'm currently seeing differs from everything that's seen before. Now, there's one thing that's really great at this, that's machine learning. Machine learning is great at finding patterns in messy data. It's kind of what it's made for. Um, anything where you can't reason about it in Excel, you can kind of feed into a machine learning algorithm um, together with a data scientist and actually find kind of the hidden correlations between this data. Um, virtually anything you can't reason about in Excel. If you have lots of data and you try to plot it out and you can't find the correlation between certain axes, but you know there is something going on, and there might be something, something like this um, between the vibration pattern and the fault state of a machine. Um, a machine learning model is capable of finding that really great. Um, unfortunately, at, at first sight, it seems that machine learning and, and LoRa and IoT are very incompatible because when I was thinking about machine learning, I'm thinking about this, like clusters full of GPUs and, and specialized hardware, like Google's TPU, crunching numbers and sucking lots and lots of energy um, out in a centralized location. And that is something we don't have. We need to do this intelligence on device rather than, than send this all back to the cloud and do the processing there because we can't due to cost and bandwidth concerns uh, and power concerns. Um, fortunately, over the, over the last two years, something really interesting has been happening. Um, inspired by the OK Google model, the, the thing that runs on your phone. I'm, not, I'm hoping I'm not triggering lots of phones at the moment. Um, but inspired by this OK Google model, um, Pete Warden uh, at Google and Neil Tan at ARM 
started thinking about, okay, well, if we can do speech recognition on a very tiny signal processing chip, because that is what Google is doing, they don't run the OK Google model on their main processor, because it's much too power hungry, the main processor is asleep, and then a small signal processing chip is then responding to the keywords. And they realized, well, if a Google team can actually build a model that is so small that it can run at this very small, specialized, low-power processor and, and be always on, why can't we apply this to much other fields in generic machine learning fields? Um, so uh, Pete started working on a project called TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Neil started working on a project called MicroTensor. Um, and both of them are approaches where you take a trained machine learning model. So they don't do training, but you take a trained machine learning model and kind of compile that down to optimize mathematics that you can then run on anything that is uh, an IoT or an embedded device. And the reason they can do that is because, well, a machine learning model is in essence is a, is a mathematical function just with lots and lots of little parameters. And finding the right value for every single one of those parameters is a very, very compute intensive process. But after you found that formula, it is literally just applying that. It's lots of, lots of multiplications. And we saw earlier, like even underpowered and low powered devices that run off a battery have a processor that's capable of doing millions of these little, uh, little computations every second. So once we found that mathematical function, we can just we can write optimized mathematics and then take advantage of like the vector extensions on your on your device to really do that very very efficiently. Um, so that was the first premise. Then after that, when people realized that it was actually possible to do this kind of thing, um, we started working on how can we make this even better. So um, we realized that there's a trade off that you can make where you say, well, I am trading a little bit of accuracy for a lot more speed um, by saying, well the parameters in this mathematical function should not be floating point uh, numbers, which they traditionally were, because they're rel they take a lot of space and they're pretty heavy to compute. It's harder to compute a matrix of floating point numbers than a matrix of fixed point numbers. Um, so if you make everything fixed point and reduce the space from four bytes to a single byte, um, we gain a lot of speed and we lose a little bit of accuracy. Um, we realize that we can reduce the number of parameters in these models. There are certain parameters in the mathematical function that actually don't contribute too much to the result, so we can prune them out. Um, and companies like ARM have been working really, really hard to add new hardware-optimized paths to their chips, specifically for these types of, uh, of operations. So this whole movement kind of came together about two years ago. Um, there's now an um, a organization that is that is. Uh, running uh, running workshops around this and running uh, running a really big conference, um, and it's kind of big, kind of like a movement rather than a single product. Um, but all of it is targeting battery powered microcontrollers, so perfect for what we're doing with LoRaWAN, for example. So this is really good at messy high resolution sensor data. If you have a temperature sensor that sends data every ten seconds, probably not a good fit. But stuff like recognizing sounds, which is at a really high frequency. Very good idea, like putting a sensor on your window and then detecting when a window breaks or something is happening around it. Perfect. Um, Biosignal analysis, um, putting a sensor around your wrist or something and looking at your, uh, your blood flow and then trying to determine if you're, if you're healthy or, or getting sick. Great. Um, and anything with vibrations, like I have a vibration pattern, is it abnormal, yes or no? So this kind of stuff. Um, so if we want to go from zero to model, then the very first thing is that it starts with raw data. Like always get data at the highest resolution possible. If you currently have data from an accelerometer and you sample once every second, not good enough. Like start sampling at the highest resolution possible because then you can only capture all the very small variations. And then yeah, later you can might be might downsample it, but always get raw data at the highest resolution possible. Um, offloading this naturally is is very hard to do over LoRaWAN. Um, so use a secondary mechanism. Use a serial connection to, to get it out, um, send it over Wi-Fi, store it on SD cards, um, et cetera. There's one way you can say, well, the moment that I go into data collection mode, I send a, I send a downlink signal from the network to my device, say, okay, now capture data. 
write it down, write it off to an SD card, and a few weeks later, I, I retrieve it, um, something like that. But yeah, start with raw data, preferably from the real device that you're going to deploy at a really high resolution. Um, then extract meaningful features. Um, one of the ways that people see machine learning is you have raw data. You don't do any pre-processing. You just throw it in a model, and then the model will try and figure it out. That works if you have lots and lots and lots of data and lots of computes. Um, but if you know what type of signal you're looking at, I'm looking at vibration data, or I'm looking at audio data, um, actually doing feature extraction using the same procedures we've, we've known for the last 20 years in digital signal processing is super useful, reduce your feature space, and will get you a much better working model. Um, so an example here is that we have audio, which a second of audio is about 16,000 data points. Um, and then we, we extract a spectrogram from it, which kind of contains as much information, it's kind of a similar amount of information, just organized differently and kind of optimized um, that we can feed it to our, our machine learning model. And we can go from 32,000 features, so 2 times 16,000, um, because 2 bytes to 240 different features. So that helps. Um, and even if you, you kind of think that you're reducing the number of, of points that you have, um, this actually works very nicely. Like on the left, we have uh, me doing some movements with a dev board, up and down, giving a fist bump and drinking a beer, and the, the, the three things I do it during a day. Um, and then the raw data is kind of messy, right? Like the blue and the, and the orange dots are kind of in between. And if I ask you to write a program that can tell me with 99% accuracy, if I give you, a, give you one of those points and you need to tell me if it's just an up, down or beer, it's going to be very hard because there's all this overlap. Like if it's all the way on the left, you kind of know, okay, that's probably always beer. But if it's in the middle, it could literally be every single one of these. Um, feature extraction can help you and kind of separate this already and make, make your life a lot easier. Um, so if you're looking at, if you do a fast Fourier transform over the signal and look at the first, at the height of the first peak on all the three axes, and then we plot that, we can already separate this. So even if you don't use any machine learning after that, um, it will make your life a lot, a lot easier if you just do some proper feature extraction. And then letting the computers figure it out. So this is where the machine learning part comes in. Um, when people think about machine learning, they think neural networks these days, which is kind of like getting all the hype. They're not the only game in town. Um, for classification, anything where you need to know what is happening, um, am, I, am I running or am I walking? Neural networks are great for that. Um, Anything with audio, I have an input speed signal, and I want to know like if someone said yes or no, neural networks are great for that. Um, but there are also more traditional models, which are a lot easier to explain and are a lot le a lot more efficient. Like what we use for anomaly detection, seeing if something is normal or not, is just a simple clustering algorithm. We take all the data we have, and this is a, sim a, a simplified view of just two axes, but you kind of look at all your data on 30 different axes, try to draw circles around it, and then when new data comes in, see if it is in one of those circles, yes or no. Um, if so, then yeah, we've seen this data before, it looks like data we've seen before, otherwise this is data outside of this and we need to flag it. And then deploying, so um, in the end, the whole idea of this tiny moment is that we can deploy it back to device. So there's a variety of tools, Google has TensorFlow Lite, which can transform the neural network, the machine learning part of that into optimized code um, we also need it for the signal processing pipeline um, and the anomaly detection code, et cetera. Um, so that's that's some software that we are writing as Edge Impulse um, to to get this whole kind of pipeline, this whole flow, compile it into something really optimized, and you can ship that library as part of your uh, LoRaWAN products. And we're gonna we're gonna be doing this in a, in the in the practical part. And once you have that, um, you kind of have a model that you can run continuously on device. This can be done in really, really low power mode. Um, so what we do in, in our example is that we take, we sample for four seconds, slice it up in two second windows, um, then classify each of those windows, and then we see if the result is now different, and then we send the message. Um, so instead of constantly sending data like, oh, this is the current value, we can wait for status changes like, if I have a sheep, when the sheep is walking, and only then send a message. So be much more efficient with what I send, and only send something when it's relevant. Um, so if you want to get started after this, um, after this workshop session, um, uh, and you want to build 
if you if you've been in the Amsterdam session, I hope you uh, you remember this. We had Johan Stocking dress up as a as a sheep to demonstrate like the power of of machine learning and LoRa. Um, so if you want to do that, get some hardware. So the easiest way to get started is with the ST bl 475 e IT01A board, IT Discovery Kit. It's a really nice board, 80 megahertz processor, 128k of RAM, um, available for about 50 bucks. Um, and you can just plug a LoRa shield in it. 1261, 1272, or 1276, and it will just magically work. Um, so this is a really, really great way of, of getting started um, on that. If you want to just explore what is possible with sensor data and machine learning, grab your smartphone. Um, we have a, a little UI. You can just scan a QR code, and you can sample data and, and train the machine learning model straight from your phone. Um, and then in Edge Impulse, we have a, an ingestion service. So if you have any dev board with sensor data, Wrap it up in a very simple JSON structure and give it to us, and we'll I will help you with that. Um, connectivity to TTN, yeah, just plug in the shield. That's it. <laughs> um, so what we do with Edge Impulse is we kind of help with the life cycle of this. So we we do TinyML as a service. I see uh, TinyML for someone who's not a data scientist. So we help you get data in real time from real sensors. Um, doesn't matter how they're connected or who the manufacturer is. We help you build a data set and organize the data set. We help you then kind of generate a machine learning process, look at what is valuable information for you, um, and, and validate that what you've just created actually makes sense and, and gives you good results. Help you test it with real-time data, data flows from your device, um, and then finally deploy it back. So we give you open, all the code that we produce is open source, royalty-free, no licensing fees, and you can place it on your device and just go with it. Um, there's a bunch of docs that we have around like end-to-end -end tutorials and vibration and audio, and they work perfectly fine also with LoRaWAN. We just put on our blog uh, an article on how you can incorporate um, the models you build in Edge Impulse into your LoRaWAN deployments. Um, so with that, I want to actually go build a model. So the idea that, we, that I had here is that the, um, the live classification demo that we did during the the Things Conference in Amsterdam, where um, in there we had a sheep and a sensor. And the sensor was attached to the arm of the sheep. And then the sheep was doing a bunch of movements, in our case, uh, kind of fitness activities. So we had walking, just standing, um, jumping jacks, push-ups, etc. cetera. Um, and that is something that you can actually replicate. So we're going to build this kind of a small version of that model in the next 25 minutes. Um, and a small version because I am sitting here at my desk rather than uh, I'm going to be able to stand here and, and talk at the same time. So we're going to do some smaller movements, but uh, the same principles apply. So I'm going to switch to um, my um, Edge Impulse project. So how you get there is uh, you go to edgeimpulse.com, um, you can sign up, and then you, get, you go to our studio, which is uh, a bit similar to the console in the Things Network. It's the place where all your devices live, where all your data lives, where you can then design a, a device flow. Um, so um, as said earlier, like getting the training data, getting the initial raw data, don't do it over LoRaWAN. Because I need we need um, raw sensor data, and preferably we need minutes or hours worth of that data at a really high frequency. And you're going to be violating your duty cycle limitations quite quickly. So um, what I do here is I have a, just a serial connection to the board. Uh, the disco board, fortunately, can also talk Wi-Fi. So we can get the data straight from Wi-Fi at that point. Um, and the idea is that we just, we're just going to do, some, do something, send the raw data over, and then, and then look at it. So um, I did some data collection already prior, so I have nine and a half minutes of data, and I've done that over four different classes. So uh, one is me moving the device up and down, like this. The other one is me waving. Um, then I'm uh, like a little snake going over my desk. Um, and the last one is just sitting idle. Now, if you, if you want to replicate this, strap it to your arm and then make the classes standing, walking, uh, jumping jacks, push-ups, um, et cetera, what you want to do. Um, so my dev board is connected here over serial. Um, and now I can, I can label some data and then get the data straight from me. So let's, let's add some wave data here. 
I'm now I'm waving. I hope my camera is visible. All right, so that is some raw data. Um, this is accelerometer data, so it's kind of messy. Um, but you can kind of see that I'm moving over the x-axis, which is from left to right, which is kind of what I'm doing. Um, if you look at other wave data, it kind of looks similar. Um, the orientation of the device naturally matters as well. So um, if you're going to wear it on your right arm and then you're going to, and then when you try it out, you flip the sensor upside down and you put it on someone's left arm, um, that is something you need to take into account. So get as much variation of the data as possible. Um, so uh, let's add some more data, some up, down. And so this way we build our data set. So for the demo at the Things Conference in Amsterdam, we actually had um, Dan, which is uh, one of our one of our employees, um, standing here in my living room, just doing jumping jacks and uh, and, do, and doing and doing push-ups for 15 minutes. So, um, so with this raw data, um, we can now kind of look at like what makes up down unique in my data set and what makes wave unique in my data set. Um, and we see that as kind of an impulse. So the raw data that we have might be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe an, a minute long, um, but we're not interested in like classifying a minute worth of data. We're just looking at like a small slice of this. Um, so we, we slice it up in two second windows. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Then I want a feature extraction step um, to reduce the, the space that I need to look at. Um, so we'll be adding a spectral analysis block um, and then a learning block. So let's just start with a, with a neural network because we want to classify between those four things. I want to classify between idle, snake, up, down, and wave. Um, so if you've ever done uh, some signal processing, this should be pretty familiar. Um, first, we want to denoise the data. So when I'm moving, I'm not moving in a perfect, uh, I'm not moving in a perfect motion. I'm, there's a little bit of jitter in, and I'm, I'm shaking a little bit, that kind of stuff. Um, so I want to remove that noise, and then I want to look at like where the peaks, like how fast am I moving, and with how much energy am I doing that. So what we do here is kind of configured it already, but we we do a a low pass filter to remove the noise. After that, I'm looking at the frequency domain, so how how fast am I moving with how much energy, and then we look at the spectral power. Um, and when I'm looking at like different wave movements, they should all look pretty similar. Like you still see like a big peak or a little bit like one or 1.2 Hertz. Um, and when I look at some other data, like up down, it should look very diff. It should look uh, at, uh, for example, snake or something. There's a very distinct pattern sitting in here. Um, so a bit of tips. We have some other blocks also for audio, um, for vibration at much higher frequencies, and you can plug in your own blocks as well. So let's generate some features. So what we do now is we go over the whole data sets, the 10 minutes of data. Um, we slice it up in little windows, and then we run the feature extraction step over all of them. And that's going to be our input for our, for our ML model. Um, so about two more seconds. Um, so what we're going to have here on the right is our feature explorer. So this is going to plot all the data in our data set. Um, together. So this is not one sample, it's all the samples together. Um, so looking at uh, the height on the different peaks, I can already like start separating quite nicely, right? I see a nice cluster here of wave data. I see some uh, snake data sitting here and some blue data a bit more spread around. So it's already much cleaner um, and much easier for me to start determining what it actually was. Um, so Let's add a, a classifier then. Um, so a neural network as set is kind of a mathematical function with lots of parameters. Um, and all these parameters start out random. And then we, we start tweaking them a little bit in, ex, in every step and then verifying how well is it doing um, on our data set. Um, at the beginning, it will be pretty terrible because all these, all these little parameters are kind of um, zero. Um, but we can tweak them a little bit later. Um, someone in, in the chat asking how about audio and image processing? Yes, audio and image processing, totally viable. Video, no, um, but we, uh, we do classification on audio. Um, we can do still images, like object detection. Um, 
So at the beginning, we're performing very poorly. We basically think everything is idle, idle, either, either idle or snake. So that is not a not a very good model. So let's train a little bit more. So every one of these training cycles is a way of um, um, like tuning these little parameters. And we can also give you some insights on what the on-device performance is going to be. So we expect this model to take six, six milliseconds on a Cortex-M4 um, and take about five kilobytes of, of, of memory, which is very well within kind of the capabilities of most LoRa devices at the moment. Um, so once this is done training, it will, the performance will actually shoot up a lot. Um, let's actually see. Um, so actually, we shot up to 100%. This might, this might typically be a sign that it's trained a little bit too well. So it's performing really well on data that I've seen before, but not on new data. Um, but naturally, we can we can kind of validate that, right? We don't have to trust the metrics that we have here. Um, so device is still connected over serial, not over lower one yet. But I can sample some more data and ask the network to classify this. Um, and this is a nicer way to do it over this because I don't need to wait for a Download window and I can send the raw data over, which is still much more than fits in a single frame. Um, so let's do some up and down. Um, so yeah, at this point, object classification on images is not available yet. We're working with a partner um, to be released later this year. Um, so it's uh, the up down movement. Um, and well, out of the 38 windows it got from this five seconds, uh, five seconds, we thought it was up down 38 times. So that was perfect. Um, they worked really well. Um, last, uh, however, neural networks work really nicely at stuff that's kind of something like they've seen before, and it works very poorly against data that's never ever seen before, like unlike anything it's seen before. Um, so, if I if I do something that is completely unexpected, like shake my device, um, the network will still classify it as something. But it's probably not going to be the right thing. Um, so, OK, well, I thought it was up down again. Um, but this was not right, right? I'm, I'm shaking the device. It is not, uh, it's not, it's, it is not up down. Um, and that's kind of the, the big problem there is with neural networks. They always are going to diverge to one of the classes that we've put in. Um, in this case, apparently, the up down. Um, and that is a risk if you want to deploy something, actually, to thousands of devices. It is really hard to trust these devices if um, there are cases where you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to give the wrong prediction. Um, and this is where kind of classical ML can pop in. So if we're looking at um, our spectral features block here, um, the data that I've just classified is in pink or in uh, purple. And it's very far outside of any of the known clusters. So we see our wave cluster here, we see our up down cluster, our idle and our snake cluster, and our, our new data is very far away from this. Um, and we can get advantage of that. So let's add a, an anomaly detection block, a second learning block. Um, and as the inputs, we select the three axes that we just saw, just for clarity. So the root mean squared on x, y, and z. Um, and what we now learn is that we start drawing these little circles around all these um, uh, around all our data points. And then um, the blue circles around that are just kind of where do we trust data? So if we look at uh, the up down that I did earlier, it sits very nicely in a cluster here. So there's nothing going on here. It's perfect. Um, however, if I'm moving to, um, if I'm looking at the, the one where I shook very vividly, this is outside of any known cluster. So I know I don't trust this data anymore. Um, so when I go back to live classification and I, I do that again, we now see that we'll overwrite the neural network and say, well, we don't trust it. Actually flag it and send it back. Um, and that is actually a very, very good point to send the result of your signal processing back over, uh, both over an uplink message because there is something going on that you've never encountered before someone should take a look at the device or, or look at the raw data and see what's, what was going on. So we see that now we see 38 anomalies and we overwrite the, we overwrite the neural network here. All right, so as said, we can do this for vibration data, we can do this for, for uh, movement analysis, biosignals, um, audio. Um, but how are we going to get this on the device? Um, so I'm having 
the um, I'm having the so typically this is, this is something that takes a little bit longer than, than what we do just do just here, right? It's a, it might take a couple of days to get the model right. Um, but once you have all that, um, I take my dev board, the very same one. I take my radio shield, in this case the SX1261 shield that I got from Semtech. I plug them in. Um, and, um, and I can go to the deployment tab in Edge Impulse. And in here, I can say that I want the whole model that I just trained. Um, I want to take the whole model that I just trained and then export it as a C++ library. So what we now do is we take the Sigma processing code, we take the um, spectral feature, uh, we take the neural network, we take the anomaly detection code, et cetera, et cetera, and create a simple zip file with C++ code that can run on any device. So there's no dependencies here except for a C++ compiler. Um, so uh, let me then go to my IDE. Uh, and this is very highly optimized math. So if we have factor extensions on the device, we can leverage that, et cetera. Um, so here I have my IDE. Let me remove my old model. Um, so what we have here is the uh, LoRaWAN example for this specific board. So there's nothing really special. Um, what we can do, we just drop these three folders in. Um, and this will give us a single function. And a single function is just called EI run classifier. You give some data, some sensor data in, and then we'll just get the result back. We think it was either up down or we thought it was um, um, or we thought it was wave, we thought it was something else. Um, so first of all, I have a device here connected over ABP to TDN V3 stack. Um, and then I collect some data from the accelerometer. So for a while, we take data from the accelerometer. We store it in our um, Excel data array, just an array of, of data that we have. Um, and then finally, we call the run classifier function. And we call it multiple times. So what we do here is we take we have two second windows. Then we sample for four seconds. And then that four seconds we split up in multiple two second windows. OK, so the reason that we do this is because I, let's say I'm doing like a small subtle movement and my ML model is not good, and my ML model is actually classifying this as something, um, then it becomes really uh, important kind of when you do the sampling. Like if I take up my device, maybe for two seconds, it actually looks like I'm, I'm doing a slow up down movement, but I know I'm not doing that because I'm just, it's idle and I pick it up and then it's idle again. So we take this four seconds uh, of data and then slice it up to these multiple two second windows because that will give us many conclusions. So when I'm doing actual up down, it might say, well, this was 21 times up down. But when I'm picking it up, and then doing nothing with it might say, well, I thought it was four times up down and 17 times or 13 times idle and, and a few times anomalies. If I see this, I know that I don't trust um, this. I don't trust this thing, so I discard it. Um, so that's why we do that. So we take four seconds of data, we do it multiple times, and then we do we send the conclusion over. Um, um, so then, when there's a state change and a valid frame, a message to TTN, just with a conclusion. Um, and the message that we send is um, idle snake. It's an array of of, um, of six values. And the first item in the array is the number of frames we thought were idle. The second one is the number of frames we thought were snake. The third one, the number of frames up, down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we send it over to TTN um, here. Very simple, very simple array of results. 
So just six, six frames or uh, six bytes. Um, so integrating that into your current firmware is really easy. It's you get a you get a package, you compile it in, and you call the function. That is it. It is as simple as normally calling a driver for your temperature sensor and asking what the current temperature is. Um, but rather now you actually get a conclusion of what is going on. So let's compile this and flush it. So there's no dependency or something on embed or on the ST board. This will run on. This will even run on your on your laptop uh, if you want to compile it there. We have some examples available in the docs, and they're deploying your impulse locally. Um, and while this is happening, I'll disconnect from the serial daemon, and I'll open up um, a serial connection to the board. So then you can see the data that's coming straight from this board. Um, as said, this board is a 80 megahertz processor. It has 128 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and we can do this classification incredibly fast on this device. So we take about 8 kilobytes of RAM out of the 128K that we have here. Um, and um, we do about one second of analysis in 10 milliseconds. So there's four seconds of data that we need to, uh, yeah, so the, the 20 frames that we do or something, it takes 200 milliseconds um, out of the four seconds. So this is much better in real time. And we can do this for audio as well. Even on this tiny, tiny little dev board, we can do real time audio processing. Um, so we sample some data for four seconds and then we get this array, right? So these are 21 frames. Um, we see the oh, anomaly score here then idle, then snake, then wave, uh, and then up down or, diff, or the other way around. But kind of we, we look at all our frames here and we think it's 21 times was idle. So in that case, we send something to TTN. It's still laying on my desk. So the next frame we still look at, okay, well, the result was still unchanged. So in this case, I'm not going to do anything. Um, so let's actually see if this pops up in TTN. Very first of all, so I can go to my um, to the TTN console. Um, I have my device here, and look at the data. Let me restart. And the first event that I'm that I'm expecting is that I'm I'm seeing some idle data. It's naturally always the demo effect. Um, so I'm expecting some idle data sitting in here. No data coming through. That is not great. All right, well, in that case, I'm uh, just trust me that the data will come here. We have a, a demo here at 5 p.m. on the main stage where we're going to be uh, utilizing this in a little bit different fashion during uh, the Jane Fonda workshop uh, quarter. Um, but let me show you how this, how this works like on device. So. Um, right now, the device is just sitting here. Um, it is, um, when it's going here, it will be idling. Um, and then I'll pick up the device and I'll actually start doing some up-down movements. So we see idle 21, uh, moving the device up and down. Naturally, you have to wait until there is a, um, until we're not violating a duty cycle anymore, so there's a bit of time between. So now we think this was 21 times up down, and now we actually send the message over. Oh, and the data is in here as well. So we see um, 21 times up down coming in here. Um, so just raw data on port 15. Um, and right after, because now I put the device back down, um, I am seeing um, that is Johan's device. He's testing it, I think. Um, I see another data message so I, I see another data message and here I see that it's 21 times idle again so very easy very straightforward in actually including um, so yeah some people asking in the in the chat is the software compatible only for the board you said no so this is it is normal it's C++ code they can integrate with anyone's firmware so very easy very easy to integrate um, so 
Cool. Very, very easy. So we can do this for vibration data. We can do this for audio data and integrating this into your workflow should be trivial. So I hope that this is a way where we can actually start adding um, proper intelligence to LoRaWAN device very quickly. Um, so let me recap. Um, I think, for, first of all, the machine learning hype is real. It is, we've done some amazing progress and it's not a magic bullet or something. It's not something that, you know, was there all of a sudden. There's a lot of really, really hard work by companies like um, Google, Arm, Qualcomm, and, and us um, in actually making this happen. It is not trivial, but we're getting there. Machine learning is real and is really applicable to small sensor devices. Um, and they can, they can solve problems that are very, very, very hard to normally distinguish on these devices because we kind of have to throw away all this data. And running an ML model that can actually detect this and much more complex events is super valuable. Um, Machine learning and LoRaWAN, in my opinion, are a perfect fit. Like I come from a background of, of building first LoRa networks and then LoRa devices and then driving the, the standards. I see way too much very like kind of small, low value use cases. Um, and adding machine learning to your deployment is a way of like offsetting that. We can do much more complex decisions here and go after much higher value use cases when applying ML to these problems. So machine learning and LoRaWAN are an absolute perfect fit, especially they're also battery powered, so fantastic. Um, so yeah, start using the remaining 99% of your sensor data. Um, at Edge Impulse, we offer a, a free developer uh, program. Just go to the website, sign up. Uh, we have a tutorial on doing this with LoRaWAN. Um, some other people have, have been starting to write tutorials using their own favorite boards. It's trivial to get data in. Um, yeah, it requires a bit of iteration, but I think it's a very valuable, valuable skill um, to learn. Um, I also would like to then redirect you to the uh, main stage right after this, because we are going to take what we just did into practice during uh, our uh, like small Jane Fonda workouts video. So I'm going to go offline very quickly and prepare for that, and I hope to see all of you in uh, 12 minutes on the main stage. Thank you.